Hey guys, this is And The Writer Is, and I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of writers and artists over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life and the industry, politics, composition, whatever. If you ask me, songwriters are some of the most worldly and intelligent people I've ever come across. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. Now I'm co-producing this with my friend Joe London, who was nominated for a Grammy earlier this year for Best Country Song. He makes us sound like angels. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, go to Spotify and look up our playlist, And The Writer Is, or go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate us on whatever your preferred podcast listening site is, whether it's iTunes or it's one of the others. We appreciate that effort and thank you. Today's guest is pretty exciting for me. He was actually one of my old booking agents from my band Glacier Hiking. That is before he started writing number one songs. That's right. He was the kind of guy who was writing number one songs on the side. I mean, most of the time when someone tells me that they want to be a songwriter and they're doing some other job, I just assume that songwriting is a hobby for them. But this guy was talented enough that his hobby brought him number one worldwide smashes. So this one we recorded a little bit ago. We did it in the morning, which is why we start this thing eating breakfast. It's pretty much that vibe the whole way. I mean, I've known Evan for about 10 years, and the reality is, is that I had no idea some of these details in this story. So I'm really excited for you guys to listen and find out the truth about Evan Bogart. But before we get into the actual podcast, I just want to say one thing about Evan. Evan is the guy who's advocating for songwriter rights. He's the one going to DC. He's the one talking to Congress. And he's the one who's vice president of the Grammy board in Los Angeles. He reminded me a little bit ago that a lot of songwriters are busy advocating for whatever they believe in, which is important, but they need to advocate for themselves and they need to advocate for the community because that's how we make a living. And that's how we are able to afford the ability to fight for whatever our interests really are. Now, Evan is a true entrepreneur in the music business. He comes from a tremendous lineage. His father was the founder of Casablanca Records, which had Kiss and Donna Summer, and his mother was Kiss's manager. A few notes for you to follow along. We'll just go through this quickly. Evan's company is Boardwalk Entertainment. He has a partnership with E-Man, which is the creative company. When he talks about Wally, he's talking about Tom Wally, who is the former chairman and CEO of Warner Brothers and former president of Interscope Records. He also talks about JR, who's JR Rotom. He talks about Zach, who's Zach Katz, who's the current president of BMG Music, who also was the co-founder of Beluga Heights with JR Rotom. He talks about Jimmy, who's Jimmy Iovine, the founder of Interscope. He talks about Josh Humiston, who was an agent and a partner at APA, which is an agency that was where Glacier Hiking, my band that I was earlier talking about, was signed. He talks about Jay Brown, who's the co-founder and CEO of Rock Nation. He talks about Lindy, who's Lindy Robbins, one of the best top liners in the music business. And the rest you can find out as you listen to this episode of And The Writer Is. This is our theme song? I don't know, man. I love it. Okay. Welcome (laughs) to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's guest is an industry force. There are a few people who have been as influential from both the creative and business sides as much as this writer has. He's produced television shows and movies, but as he once told me, if he stops writing songs, the house of cards will fall. From Los Angeles, this hit maker has written huge copyrights and created an impressive multimedia company. Most importantly, he was one of the first to introduce me to writing pop music while he was one of my old band's booking agents. And the writer is my friend and Boardwalk's founder, Evan Kid Bogart. (sighs) As he enters from the closet. Yeah, okay, so anyway, (laughs) 
I brought you bagels. Yes. So there are uh, there's everybody sesame. knows everybody knows I don't talk without bagels. I mean that's that's what they say. <laughs> that's just the industry. Evans the everybody bagel knows guy. That. Yeah. You're the bagel guy. You're like, so there's plain. I don't no. mean and we don't mean that obviously in like an anti-Semitic way either. Obviously. No, no, no. Not like not. not like he's bageling or something. It's not like. Right. Well, I mean, I think. Oh, wait, I heard I heard that term. Jewish I heard that star, term. Star that you have on your yeah, chest yeah. right now. It's sort of like, You know. Um, but yeah, here, help yourself, and then I'll eat one of them too. But. Uh, we got egg in there and sesame and everything, and then there's chive and there's regular cream cheese. What did you think I was gonna have? Maybe you'll be an everything thing, or or you'll surprise me with an egg and be like, you know what? When it comes to food, I'm simple. Hey, pass that, pass that. Oh, but I've yeah, okay. Oh, uh, hey, um, it is hard to pass. Yeah, <laughs> what, um, it's hard uh, to pass when I have this large thing in my mouth. <laughs> um, the um, I go with sesame. Really? I'm like preferably a sesame bagel guy. I'll do an everything so I bagel. Guess I'll right. do a garlic bagel, but sesame is my shit. So I nailed it. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I wasn't, I nailed it in the sense that I ordered it, but I actually thought you were in everything. I, I could do everything. I'm doing everything, and I'm doing dill. I'm not, I don't, I don't know the dill thing. Really? Well, is that, you're, is that you're weird? what? You're, you're half Jewish? You're full, full. You're full Jew. Dude, look at my hair. Is it, <laughs> oh, it's not there is it yet. The, is it oh, the, my God. Uh, That's too much. Is it the, um, uh, I know food wise, you're really into things like, <laughs> like matzo ball soup. I love matzo like, ball soup. Is that your comfort food when you're sick? Are you? Yeah, you know, I, you know, that's like, so actually I got sick recently. I was, I was out on the road and, um, I got sick and I like hammered my cold uh-huh. with like massive amounts of chicken matzo ball soup. And Robitussin and Claritin and Slippery Elm. Do you know Slippery Elm? I don't know Slippery Elm. Slippery. But it sounds like a bad rapper. Slippery Elm, <laughs> <laughs> Slippery Elm is, is something that Fitz had told ZZ to take when she got sick on tour oh, once. Oh, wow. And, and it works? It, gets, it knocks your cold right out, Ooh. combined with other things. Who were you on the, on the road with? I went up to see ZZ. Okay. Do you go on the, Does she have a bus? Mm-hmm. Wow. This is gonna be a really interesting interview with all bagels in our mouth. Sorry for for talking with our with Sorry. food in our mouth, but yeah. it kind of feels like the thing that we should do. Yeah, you know what do we do? That's real life. But yeah, so so um, it knocked it out in like like less than forty eight hours. Like I just hammered my body with like vitamins and medicine and matzo ball soup. Wow. Yeah, and, and slippery elm. I didn't know that 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 I, I mean my my wife is really into homeopathic stuff. Slippery elm is that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I a combination. Think it works, I think it works, but more importantly, it works for our marriage. <laughs> you know, if I take it, because then she's like, "Oh, then okay, she's like, yeah, yeah." Because if you try it. to take like actual medicine, she gets mad at you. She's not into the uh, actual medicine. I mean, she, she's not. You know, the way I look at it, it I think but... it's a blend. I think it's like putting like organic drums with program drums. <laughs> it's like you, it, it's a better sound. It's a better way of right. of sound. It's a better way of getting better. Mm-hmm. You got a, a little bit of like the the doctor recommended stuff and a little bit of the like natural stuff, right? That's really funny. I was I was looking back. I was trying to find our first exchange, like our first email exchange. Our first email exchange. Mm-hmm. So I went. I was looking at Gmail. It's like all, you know, word word before I even went to Gmail. So Mine was, I was going APA. Like, I probably had an APA address, right? Yeah, I think it. I think you were at APA, and I was at Hotmail. Mm. <laughs> so I had to go to my Hotmail thing, and I had to like track down my password to try to figure out how we how we met, and. and uh, I found like the first email I found about APA coming to see my band was um, from Brett. It's from well, I I wrote an email saying AP, some APA reps came and saw the band last night, and which is crazy because that's you know that's that era where you're so excited when anybody shows up to your, see your band. Mm-hmm. So that's like a that was a big deal, but that was that was June first. 2006. So that has been uh, nine years, over nine years. It's almost our 10 year anniversary. I know. What do we do? What We're do doing we? this. <laughs> we'll do a podcast. That's right. <laughs> That's that thing. Like, where do you where do you see yourself in five years? I see myself. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Yeah. I see myself in 10 years doing a podcast with you. <laughs> right, right. I see myself in ten years talking about the the podcast we did ten years ago. <laughs> sort of, I agree. You know, that's exactly it's like two thousand twenty six, and we're like, man, yeah. do you remember ten years ago when we did that podcast? Yeah, that's that was what happened. Crazy. In 10 years. <laughs> I know. So it's been nine years, and you actually said to me, um, 
this was, I guess, S- when did SOS come out? 2006. So I think that it must have just come out. And you were kind of in this phase of, I'm still going to be a, a booking agent and yeah. show the world that I'm a booking agent who can write hit songs. That was, that, I, was like de- I was like determined. That was it. That's, all, that's what I wanted to do. Isn't that the that the is it, are you the first booking agent who has a I think I might who be had the a number one song <laughs> maybe I'm not I mean you know obviously you have people like Matt Galley who like he didn't write the songs but he has like a successful record label while being a, a big booking agent oh wow yeah there's you know right. certain people like that but um, I think probably on the creative side yeah I mean bo- being a booking agent is inherently the least creative thing you could do <laughs> um, <laughs> what does and, that mean why how is that not creative. I mean, because other than discovering bands, which I love to do, no matter whether I was a booking agent or whatever, um, after that it kind of stops because from once the te- once the band has like a team, mm-hmm. you're the agent. Like, why is anyone listening to you? As far as like, right. you know, I really think that like sonically you should, or hey, you know, style wise you should. You know, I I actually fortunately had this kind of relationship with the bands that I'd signed. The first two bands I'd signed at the agency were Republic. Right. Um, well, One Republic at right. the time, Republic and the Outline. Oh, right. Which, wow. Which is Ryan Rabin from obviously Group Love and Captain Cuts and uh, Graham Fink, the lead singer of Milo Green. Wow. That was their band that was on Capitol. So my two bands were Ryan, were Tedder's band and and Captain Ryan Cuts. Ryan and Milo and uh, and uh, Graham's band. And uh, I was really involved with them creatively. Sure. But. As a typical booking agent, it's there's nothing creative about it. You just decide like, should I should I route should I end in California? <laughs> should I start in California? And that's pretty much the the that's your create your creative uh, contribution. The idea that that you're sitting there as a booking agent with a number one song, and that was your first song you ever wrote. Isn't that something like that? Like it was your first pop song. You told me that. Kind of. It was like the what is it? It was like the second or third that I took seriously. And it, um, that's crazy. That's nuts. So we had put together this. I was at the agency. Okay, so I was. I had come out of this terrible relationship where I had a terrible cocaine problem. Wow. <laughs> and had lost my job. What working. year is this? This is two thousand and four. Okay. Two thousand and four. Um, I I um, I broke up with this girl who I actually was secretly married to. We got, we got like secretly married in Las Vegas. I have like the craziest stories of all time. So, but we'll just start. But I've there. known you for a let's, long time. I didn't know. Let's that you've start been married. there. Yeah, I love this. this. this okay, <laughs> let's back. start. Let's start there. Whoa. So, coming off of this relationship where I was in, I was doing A and R for Wally at Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. I was managing artists, uh, an artist on on DreamWorks named Vicious, a rapper that Michael Goldstone and, and Jeff Sosno had signed, and I had a up and coming producer from the Bay Area that I was managing. Who had, who I had dis, had discovered through a friend of mine, and who was producing Vicious's album, a uh, guy by the name of Jonathan Rodham, and I was what? These were my clients, and um, I basically the girl tried to stab me. Your wife? Yeah, a secret wife that no one. Yeah, knew. okay, we'll call you no secret one, wife. No, secret it wife. Sort of sounds like you're secret like wife. Running secret wife tried to an stab FLDS me. compound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> secret wife tried to stab me, um, and. I basically had lost my job at Warner Brothers. JR, you know, I couldn't manage anymore. I was just completely, like, caught up in this drug lifestyle scene of L.A. I like, bought into my own hype. Like, all this crazy, crazy shit. I was a terrible, I was just an awful, entitled asshole, right? Wow. So, um, How old were you at that point? Uh, like it was last year. No, um, <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, tw- now. 20, oh God, how old was I? 26? Okay. Yeah. That's the right age to have an ego yeah, yeah. problem. It was like a quarter, it was like a quarter life crisis. Right. Basically. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah. And I basically copped to my parents that I was, see- I had gotten married in Vegas and this girl tried to stab me and I like moved home and I was like, and like Vicious got dropped from DreamWorks and Wally, Wally let me go. And, uh, JR, you know, I had given JR to Zach cause I didn't know what to do. And Zach had just, had stopped being a lawyer and become a manager. Zach was my lawyer. So you introduced Jr. and, and Zach, Zach. Yeah, Zach was my lawyer, and I and I managed Jr. Wow. And then and here's the weird thing, right? So Zach was my lawyer. I managed Jr. Zach and I managed Jr. Zach managed Jr. Zach and Jr. signed me. 
So are, right? you, part of, are you part of Beluga Heights? I was the first person signed to Beluga Heights. But you're not like a... You're not, not anymore. So when my Sony deal ended, my deal with Beluga No, Heights. I mean like you're not a partner of Beluga Heights. No, no, no I was never a partner. That was a separate I, thing. They signed me to Beluga Heights. I was their writer. Wow. So it was like a weird... It's like a weird full circle. But so uh, I had nothing and I was broke and I moved home and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was burnt out at 26. Wow. And uh, I spent the summer working part-time at a lighting store on La Brea and Melrose. Like a house lighting store? Yeah, they made, like, custom lamps and, like, they do a lot of, like, custom shades and lamps from movies. What were you feeling emotionally at that point? I was still just, I don't know, honestly. Were you still on drugs? Yeah. I was still doing a lot of a lot of coke and and drinking a lot and... Going to work all fucked up? Yeah. Wow. A little bit of that. Did you even... Were you into music at all at that point? Yeah, I was just... Like, were you listening to I music hadn't... at that point? Or were you sort of like, I don't no, care anymore about no. anything? And, and, and also, I was listening to mostly hip-hop at the time. Like, no pop music, no right. rock music, nothing. No dance music, for sure. Dance music wasn't even, like, a fashion yet. But, um, yeah, man. It was a, it was a crazy... It was a crazy time. But uh, my dad was like, you got to get a job, my stepdad. So I was like, yeah, you know, I don't know where to go. And he's like, my, my like, second cousin owns, like, a lighting store. You should go work there part-time. So I did that. And then he kept saying, like, you got to get, like, a real job, though. Like, so on the days you're you not working You have to get a there. career. Yeah, figure out what you're going to do. But he's saying was, this was, to was, a kid moved, who's, all, who's all messed up on drugs. He doesn't, I mean, know, like, he doesn't know I'm messed up on drugs. Oh, but he just they know like, you're secretly married. Now at this point in the middle of divorcing or getting that annulled or whatever, right? So, Can you say your secret wife? No, no, I don't need to know. Anything. You don't trust me. You don't want that because if wow. she hears this, you don't know. She's wow, she's, she'll find she's a wonderful person. <laughs> <laughs> she's a wonderful person. Wow. We all love her and wish her the best. Right? Is she messed up on drugs too? <laughs> she's a wonderful person, and we all love her and wish her the wow. best. <laughs> okay, so so you go, you go, and you do this is crazy. So you go, you're you're working at a lighting store. Your dad says you should. Your stepdad says you should go and do right. So get I get a job. So I have, a I, I of course because I'm 26 and I know everything. And I've at this point, you know, A and R and Eminem album and Tupac album, and I have had artists signed and I've had artists that I managed that were nominated for Grammys. And I obviously think I'm the biggest hot shit in the world who's unemployed and living at home with his mm-hmm. parents and broke. Um, Still in this sense of entitlement, like, you know, I'm also at the, you know, where it all started, obviously, was working at Interscope when I was 18 as Neil Bogart's son and, like, feeling like the world owed me something, right? Um, And then, you know, I basically decided I couldn't go work for a record label. I couldn't start at the beginning again. I couldn't go back to the mailroom. Too much pride, right? So I'm not going to go to a label. I'm not going to go to a publishing company. I can't go to do management. Like, what do I do? And I basically... And you you already have, like, when you're... It's not a bad thing when you're let go by a, a record label. We know 50 people who've been let go by a record label who then got promoted at their next job just because the industry doesn't know anything. But when you're let go by Tom Wally at this point, you're, did, did, did they know? Did everyone know about your your drug problem? Is that no, sort dude, of I was like get, what, I was getting, a, getting I was getting, I was getting a you? check and I, hadn't, I wasn't doing anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think I brought him one man in like 15 months. Right, <laughs> right. I think it was just based on the fact that I brought him stuff when I worked at Interscope for him because I, you know, he was my first right. boss at Interscope. He pulled me out of the mailroom and, and gave me my first A&R job and everything. And he, you know, taught me how to make a record with Tupac. And, you know, he, know, he knew I brought in Eminem. And he knew, you know, I brought him a bunch of other artists that got signed other places. And I was involved in their A&R team over there for him. So when he went to Warner Brothers, you know, they brought me on in that capacity of more of like, more of like a A&R scout-ish A&R type. Not, not someone right, who make right, a record. Right. I wasn't coming from a creative place. No, it was someone a who had a really good ear and eye for talent. Right. Who would find him the next bands? And right. I think like 15 months in, I hadn't brought him any like like not even like hey check this out. So by 26, you've already then. <sighs> what, when you say you you a and R, going back one step. Mm. When you say you a and R, Eminem and the first album, all that. So you're on the Marshall Mathers Slim Shady LP. The Slim Shady LP, and. How many A and R people are on that? Five. Wow. What does that mean? You one, A&R one is one is um, one is the wife of the owner of the company, and two are DJ Mormilli and right. and Dean Geislinger. And then and what does that mean? You A and R did like you were helping coordinate 
sessions or you were helping find songs and beats and like, what is it? What do you, we, what is it? We, what all just, do do? We, we all just hung out at the studio and made music. It was, I was, I was there for like the making of the entire album and you know, I did, I brought in the song as the world turns was a song I brought in track wise. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and at this point you're probably, of, you know, early I, was, I was 18 years old, 19 18. years old. Yeah. It's so messed up. And that's because we would, go to, we would go to like Tijuana to get like pills at like the pharmacia. So and, all of you guys yeah. were messed up on that. Cause you're having, fun, I was actually man. sober during the Eminem album, which is ironic. Well, I had come out of, I had come back from rehab and in high school. And start okay, writing. so let's go back. Because like and we keep, we keep, and like, we keep I mean, like, flashback. Right now, okay. Because okay. this is the weirdest so way I'll, of telling I'll, a story. I'll, 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 I'll catch you up. Okay. You guys should probably just edit it. You know, this is we could, or you could keep it like more of like an all that jazz kind of thing. Yeah, like yeah. Throws no, this, back. Is, this is <laughs> this is mo- like the flashback. Mo- momentum, momentum. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is momentum. Um, so. So uh, when I was 16, I, I was interning at Interscope mm-hmm. for Tom Wally and Steve Berman. And when I was 17, I got sent to rehab. Right. And when I was 18, I graduated co- uh, high school in, in, in Oregon in rehab. And then I came back when I was 18 and I started working in, right away in the mailroom at Interscope. Mm. I still kept in touch with everybody at Interscope and I was friends with everyone there. When I was 16 and I was interning, I was Tom's intern, and DJ was his uncle's intern, Jimmy's intern. Right. So DJ and I became really good friends. Right. And have actually been playing fantasy uh, like sports with each other literally since then. So it's been like 21 years. Right. We've been in fantasy leagues together, which sure. is awesome. Yeah. So it's that a whole, is cool. whole other podcast. Yeah, we'll get into that. <laughs> that I know a lot about. Uh, um, <laughs> but but um, yeah, so uh, when I was 18, I worked in the mailroom there. And then, you know, right after Tupac, I was there, you know, I, I was there like the day Tupac died. Like I have like memory, like vivid memories of like people like crying and like the the whole place just it was just like the saddest thing ever. And sure. All. But when I was in in uh, high school and interning there, Death Row was actually in the building, in okay. Interscope building. It was in Westwood. Yeah. So you know, like I was like the kid who get off the elevator and like you know smoke weed with like Danny Boy or Rage or like you know and like go like stuff stuff mailers and shit, you know, that kind of stuff, right? When I was 18, I was in the mailroom, and about three or four months after being in the mailroom, they needed to make a Tupac record. Um, And there was no one left there who knew anything about hip-hop. I mean, it was, Death Row was gone, obviously. They were split from <clears throat> from Interscope, and they were going back into the, to the Interscope-owned masters and figuring out how to, like, make a new record. So Tom figured this was, like, the kid who he knew was, like, a hip-hop head. Right. This was like the perfect play to teach me how to make a record. So he pulled me out of the mailroom into A and R, and was like, "You're gonna run. You're gonna be the coordinator for this. You're gonna run." You know. Did you at that point? Are you? Um, I know that you were also a rapper ish. Mm-hmm. So then, at that point, are you trying to get a record deal? I'd already tried. And I, just, I gave in already. Oh, at that point, you were like, "I'm, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm putting, you know, hanging my." I vocal, tried when I was. Cords. I tried right when I get, <laughs> got back from rehab from Oregon, uh-huh. and no one wanted to sign me. I went to New York and shot my own demo. Uh-huh. Yeah. So then, at didn't, that point, you're <laughs> didn't work. Crazy. So are you still, at that point? You're not writing anymore, though. No. I mean, no, because I'm like, well, maybe I'm just supposed to be in the business like my dad. Okay. I mean, I, I'm creative by nature, but maybe I'm not supposed to be an artist. How old were you when your dad passed away? Four. So then. And now you're the, really flashing. We're going flashing. I know, I know. The le- <laughs> <with> the le- <laughs> Back to your four. The legacy of both your dad and your mom is obviously in the industry yeah, too. Yeah. Um, is that something she ma- you, she managed? Right, right. Kiss She's, and, she managed Kiss, yeah, yeah. and you know, but you grew up around you know, a different era of music. You grew up around um, you know face makeup. And all that, yeah, and then sure. you know, and you end up in this street, uh, most street kind of music. I mean, it, but, but on the same level, kind of my s- dad did too. You know, I mean, you know, he was he was instrumental in signing Curtis Mayfield and and Bill wow. Withers and a, yeah. and a lot of that stuff to Buddha Records before he ran yeah. Casablanca, and then obviously Parliament and Chocolate City, and you know, he was always. Um, when you were saying that, do you think that Tom Wally and these people were giving you an advantage because of that, or do you think they because you grew up around music, you were more qualified? No, I think it had to do strictly the fact that like he needed someone to go in and like transcribe 120 Tupac songs, wow, and actually have an opinion about hip hop. Yeah, not just be a guy in the room. That's that's just another friend, right? Is it? So it was kind of like way of it was kind of like this is a Fanny Shakur, this is like Mo Pre right. and Tupac's brother. These are the outlaws. Sure, like go make a record. So crazy. Yeah, and you know, obviously, like 
the first six months, I transcribed every Tupac song ever written, which I have to give credit to as it, it could it, it couldn't have made me worse, but it, it's probably contributed to me being a better lyricist now. Wow, yeah, I bet you know, yeah, like, like the lit- rhyme schemes are insane. I mean, the, the amazing. timing's amazing. Yeah. So you know, I went to this vault. We pulled up every two inch reel of every song. We we had to put together like these rough mixes, and then I had to put them onto DAT. Most people don't know what that is. Yeah, no, that was there used to be these sure. small the tapes thing. called yeah. DATs. Right? Yeah, that's what I recorded um, my first album on. So DAT, so we had yeah. to put them down to DAT based on like whether they, I thought they were an A level song, a B level song, or a C level song. Wow, it was my first creative decision ever. Wait, so throughout his career, after Tupac died, and they released uh, later, you know, the stuff after he died, is it? How many of those records were ones that you worked on? All well, of them, because it was all those C sides. I right? heard all of them. Wow, but. The um, I just didn't want I to love, swallow. I, I love that we're eating bagels. I know I turned my head to swallow. And talking because, about cocaine at eleven yeah, in dude, the morning. Bagel, bagels, <laughs> cocaine, and Tupac, right? Yeah. That's gonna be yeah, my autobiography. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of the A songs, some of the B songs, and some of the C songs made the first album. It was actually a double album. It was called "Are You Still Down? Remember yeah. Me." Right. And because right. of a deal that Jimmy had made with Jive for some reason, came out as an Interscope Jive co-release, which was really weird because Tupac Jive was, was on Jive just for this album. Oh wow! So it was like an Interscope Jive co-release. Jive was through Zamba, right? Which was BMG. It wasn't Sony, obviously. I mean, nowadays you could ne- sure. Jive and Interscope could sure. never do anything because it's like the Crips and Bloods collaborating, right? right? But like. Um, the uh, the A and R's on the project were, you know, on our side and the Inter- Interscope side. The Jive didn't really wasn't really involved at all. Right. But the A and R's that are listed on the project are like Jeff Fenster and John McHugh. So it's no like my way. first time ever meeting meeting Fenster, working with Fenster was on that project. Wow. Yeah. I once said to uh, Fenster that my first CD that I ever bought was um, was Fushnikins featuring Shaquille O'Neal. Amazing. And he goes, I ain't heard that. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Hell yeah, Jeff man. Jeff Denster, not only from having an incredible pop ear now, yeah. it was is like a legendary hip-hop A&R. Yeah. And he's, legendary. He's, he's super pro. I mean, yeah. there are very few... You know, A and R guys that are actual A and R guys. He's a professional A and R. Like I know the captain brought in Tribe Called Quest, but Fenster made those records. Yeah, crazy. Like, dude, you made Tribe records, bro. Yeah. Dude, I mean, there's, that's there's, so a, there's a there's so. a there's a rapper named Ari the Rugged Man. Okay. You know that know. guy? He was signed to Jive. He actually hated his experience there. He has a song where, in the middle of the song, after the album he put out after he left Jive Records, in the middle of the in the middle of the song, he says like, "Dream, you know, dreaming about killing Jeff Fenster." <laughs> Like in the Whoa. song. <laughs> it's it's crazy. So dark. <laughs> um, wait, okay, so anyway, obviously so, the- so I'm in I'm in Interscope yeah. and um and uh yeah, so I worked there for a while and then and then while I was working on the Tupac project, I, I went to um went to a freestyle contest in Inglewood. For real? Yeah. How did that go? I saw I saw this white kid destroy everybody. <laughs> Saying things like "Don't make my facial tissue a racial issue" and stuff like all these like really creative internal rhymes, and I yeah, and I grabbed best. his demo and and brought it in and screamed at the top of my lungs for five months. No one would listen to me. So who introduced him to Dre? Total by accident. He he heard the tape got slipped to Jimmy. One while and while M was in town, we were hanging out with M. We were up at the radio station. We had Friday night flavors. The next night we were at the wake up show, um, which were. Radio shows that were on Power 106 and a, a defunct radio station called The Beat. I guess is The Beat still around? I don't know. Um, but uh, they used to have like rappers on at midnight and they would like battle and like talk about underground shit. Did and it? Dre heard it, Dre heard the demo that same weekend. M happened to be in town and Monday they met. They came into Interscope and uh, he was signed. That's made it happen. That was it. Did uh, Did Eminem ever hear you rap? Yeah, for sure. Really? Yeah, of course. In fact, the song "As the World Turns" on his first album. Yeah. The way I say, like, I gave, uh, the, I brought that track in is that track was originally a track from my demo. No. Yep. Is that real? Yeah. Do you have the demo version? Not with me, but yeah. Wow. I mean, he obviously killed it way better than me. Right, but I mean, he his, re, did he just write that he just rewrote verses? He's like, he's like, are or? you are you gonna do things? I was like, no, nah, man, I'm you know I'm done rapping. He's like, can I can I have this track? I was like, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, Marshall. Did you call him Marshall? M. M. Too is always M and M for me. Like yeah. the Bass Brothers and everybody around us would call him Marsh, Marshall. Marshall. Mm-hmm. Wow, when was the last time you saw him? 
Oh, forever. Yeah. So it's not like you guys kept in touch. No. So, okay. Um, obviously, I, I wish. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I saw him several times. I mean, you know, like my, my mom always jokes. She's like, you know, she always tells people like, M- Eminem used to be at our house. She would call me mom and he came over for Thanksgiving. Like, you know, it was that. It was like, he was like the homie. So weird. So wait, okay. So obviously there's this huge A&R thing. We're going to fast forward to. Uh, yeah, anyway, should I go? You know, uh, I go through Interscope. I leave. I go into management. Blah 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 blah. Fast and then forward, you, fast when forward. did you? When did you? Real quick. When um, you said you were sober during the Eminem thing, and then when did you relapse? When I met this girl. Oh. Thus tying the whole story together. Wow. And when this did you? This wonderful, meet? wonderful person. Right. When did you meet this beautiful? Two thousand and two. Two thousand and two. Yeah. So then, all the way to two thousand six, you're Four. like two thousand four. Two thousand four. You're having some sort of spiral. Spiral, just yeah. really quick spiral, just jumping off a cliff. Um, was that like a, that wasn't an option for you though? You weren't actually thinking in a literal sense. Oh no, 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 you no, were no, never no. like I'm suicidal too ch- with I'm it. I'm too, I'm too chicken shit to kill myself. Right, of course. <laughs> yeah, I would have said. I wouldn't even. Too. I wouldn't even like. I, like I wouldn't. Even, I wouldn't even like put needles in me. Like I don't know. Whatever. Like I'm just. I'm not a pain fan. Sure. Wow. So then, 2004, you then so anyways, you're like, so I'm leaving cut, this. Cut to, I'm getting. I'm cut getting to me my, throwing my entire life away. Yeah. Um, falling down into this spiral drug hole. She uh-huh. tries to stab me. Right. I'm working at the lighting store. Sure. Fast forwarding to everything we said, and I decide that I can't go back to a label. Point, I can't go to a publisher. I can't go to a manager. Right. And Jr. and Zach have already started Beluga Heights while you were in the lighting store. Yes. It was called uh-huh. Net, it was called Net Worth Entertainment. It wasn't uh-huh. called Beluga Heights yet. And uh, you know, I um, I didn't know. I really just didn't know what I was going to do. So I I tried to I tried to figure out. I was either going to go to work in radio because no one knew me there, or I was going to go work at an agency because no one knew me there. Right. That was my rationalization. Like if I'm going to start from the beginning, I'm going to go. And labels were not having it at this point, or I you just, didn't want. I didn't to want go to go there. because I just, I just didn't want to come back in as like I'll be an assistant again. Like, I felt like I felt like that was too much pride at that yeah, point. Yeah, dude, stupid, but understandable for my age and the position I was in. Yeah, and I, I mean, wasn't, and I wasn't, and I wasn't sober yet. Credits, okay. So um, I went and met with a ton of people. Is that is hey. the is the turkey up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The turkey's ready. Yeah. Mom, the meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> When's your stove top stuffing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I went to um I went to um to a bunch of meetings and I and uh actually Ben Gordon, you know Ben? Yeah, yeah. He was A and R Interscope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ben introduced me to this guy, Josh Humiston. Okay, right. Uh-huh. And said Josh was looking for an assistant at, at, at wow. an agency. So I went to Josh and what's that? Sorry. So you went to Josh. I went, I went to Josh and um and I uh I basically like begged him to hire me. And uh-huh. he was like, You're way too qualified to be my assistant. Are you gonna do bitch work? I said, I promise I'll be your bitch. I promise. I'll find you bands. I'm really good at that. Right. You teach me how to be an agent. Okay. I know nothing about being an agent. Sure. You think I'm overqualified, but not in this world. I know nothing. Right. So right. you teach me how to be a booking agent and I'll find you bands. Yeah. So um, you know, about a month into it. You know, being his assistant, I I, uh, I found I found the outline, right. And about two months into it, Brett was like, "My buddy is in town from Denver, and you gotta listen to this song." It was apologized like that song is amazing. He's like, "Let's right. go see him." I, we went to the show at the Roxy, and like, yeah. I was like, coke, fifteen people coked out of my mind. Wow. He played this song called like "Put Your Hands Up" or like, "Hands in the Air." I forget what the song was. Yeah. It was a great One Republic song. Yeah. I think it ended up being a Hillary Duff song at one point, but. Uh, Literally the first song of the show, like they hit the first chorus, and I looked at Brett and I was like, "We're signing them." I was like, "So coked out." Yeah. Like, We're signing them, man. This is amazing. I was yeah. like, "I'll be right back. I'm going to the bathroom." Yeah, you know? I was like, right. yeah. <laughs> um, And so came back into obviously APA the next day and was like, "You guys, you have to sign this band." This Did Brett that. work for you? Or you guys? Brett was Craig year? Newman's assistant, and I was Josh's assistant, but I also was able to sign stuff. Right. So technically, because Brett had brought it in, Craig first got One Republic. Sure. I then shopped their deal and got them signed to Velvet Hammer Columbia, their first deal. Right. And so like this is everybody, they got, everybody passed. Right. Velvet, Dave Abino at, at Velvet Hammer signed them. Um, and um, so, but they had a manager, Mar- didn't they? At the time, it was Marcus Spence. Oh right. Wait, Marcus Spence was their manager. Yeah. 
And he had met Ryan because Ryan used to be signed to Timberland to beat, right. to beat Club as a ghost, as like a writer ghost. That I knew. And he worked on like Bubba Sparks and stuff. Right. And in fact, I had met Ryan two years earlier playing ping pong at the Hit Factory in Miami. But I, did he remember that? Or no, we walked you? in and I was like, dude, I know you. And he's like, yeah, Hit Factory, right? I'm like, yeah. Like it was crazy. Yeah. Two years earlier, we had we had we spent a whole night like hanging out. Right. One of my artists was in with Scott Storch. Ryan was in with Timberland. Oh, no and we played ping pong there's... together. And that, that's definitely where you had your uh, where the drugs were out of hand. I mean, oh, if dude, you're was... with Scott Storch on yeah, but yeah. I was but I was on like massive amounts of E. I was in Miami, dude. What do you you know? Sure, sure. And Not I was with I was with, I was with the wonderful woman. <laughs> the wonderful right. girl yeah, was with so me, sweet. and she was also on E. Yeah, and it was a good time. But. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, so wow. so Ryan and I are like, oh, we know each other, whatever. So right. Craig signed it. Once I made agent because um, I took One, One Republic, became mine. Right. And then wow. once I left, Brett became agent, One Republic was his. Right. I mean, and then- And Brett and, Ryan, then, Brett and Ryan went when together. when I came in? Like yeah, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were gone at that point? Or I was, because I, I, I don't know exactly- Brett was already working with you before, before he was like a full agent. Right. He was like a junior agent. Yeah. I mean, that was what was so crazy. I, I tell that story. You know, I remember emailing some friends that were at USC because I went to USC, and this was 2006 or whatever. I said, if you guys are here, you should see, you know, Glacier Hiking, my old band, and, uh, and One Republic are playing. I promise you guys, they're going to be huge. And there were maybe, I don't know, seven people who saw them play and saw me play. Well, Ryan, and then was, we'd, Ryan was on your record. Yeah, Ryan sang the feature on 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 Save Some, one of the yeah. Glacier Hiking songs. It's so it's so bizarre to watch any of your friends go from. I mean, I do, have this do remember, conversation. Do you remember we went to the wedding in Oklahoma? Yeah, that's another story. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> but the but the idea that you go from I say this where people are as successful as the day you meet them. It's hard to adjust your head that oh yeah, Ryan's you know one of the biggest songwriters in the world and you meet him when he's, you know, when, when you're playing shows in front of 16 people, it's hard to adjust also, to your he, mind. Also uh, him writing and producing for other people at the time, but incredibly frustrated about it. What do you mean? You know, I mean, he had written the, the first single I remember him having out as a writer as since I, when I knew him yeah, as a writer producer was Nikki Flores. Right. She was signed to Epic Records. Right. And he, had a, he had a single with her called Strike. Strike yeah. While the Iron's Hot or yeah. whatever it was. It didn't, it didn't go. Sure. Obviously. Um, but like, that was frustrating for him, you know? Or like J Lo, Do It Well. Oh, I never heard of it. It was a single for her. Uh, Super frustrating. I mean, like, sure. you know, it was his. It was his, it was his learning answer. experience. I mean, he and I had a... <laughs> Just kidding. He, he basically. <laughs> he, 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 the, the only song in existence of me, JR, and Ryan uh -huh. was an Ashley Tisdale single called He Said, She Said. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. JR did the track and me and Ryan did the top line. So when did you start... When did you switch over to write with Ryan and JR? When were you like, I'm okay, done so, being so I'm at, agent? So I'm at the agency. And if you ever want to accelerate an addiction... A drug addiction. Go work at an agency, because everyone's fucked up. And really, it w I went from like I don't know this. I mean, I've I've had agents. Agents, I've been agents, to agents CAA party and, and, and UTA and, and APA they and, and, and they're all really, and they're all like super functional. Like that's like right. That's like, I feel like if they stopped doing drugs, they'd be bad agents. Right. It's the opposite. Like wow. they like. And you think that's still that's still prevalent? Um, I think that in just in the industry, there's a lot of people who are still doing a lot of drugs or drinking, and there's a lot of people who are sober, and the yeah. and the minority are the people who are neither. Right. <laughs> yeah. Agencies sure. included. Right. Probably more so actually. Agencies. Right. Um. So. So you go over to Jr. So, and you're so, like, so, hey. So, so six months into it, six yeah. months into it, I I uh, I. Uh, I go to a doctor, and he's like, "You have a hole in your in your septum. Like you burned a hole through your septum." That's sweet, and like it's whistling. And this is this is <laughs> and like, hey, I'm, like I'm like I'm like well, I'm not gonna do coke anymore, right? But I'm still gonna drink and do like and like pills and weed and stuff. The, are and you, then, you're divorced at this point. I haven't even. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm divorced from the first one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I actually have. I actually at this point am, have started dating my second wife. Okay, <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> right. Um, but um. Uh, she doesn't know that obviously I have a I have a problem at this point you know at this point, oh. and I go to um, I go to uh, New Year's uh, 
Jordy is like, come, I'm like, come, he's like, come to Vegas for New Year's. Maroon 5's playing, you know, right. come party with us all weekend. Right. So I, I went to Vegas. And, Jordan you know, Feldstein. Yeah. I, I, went, I, went, I went to Vegas and like, you know, hanging out with Adam and all of them who I grew up with, right. you know, when, sure. since we were kids and, you know, everything's like comped and we're all like doing shots and, you know, Adam's like betting like 30 grand a hand at like the tables at the Aladdin and it's like fun. Right. It's so fun. And I was up for like three days and this guy gave me a, an upper and then this six hours later, this guy gave me a downer and then I woke up and this guy's giving me an upper and I'm drinking. Yeah. And it was like crazy weekend. Yeah. And I was just, it killed me. Like I came home that weekend on the on January 3rd and I've been sober ever since. Like wow, I was like, you I just, never went to meetings or anything. You well, just a, said week that late, the... a week later, a week later I started going to meetings. Okay. So I came home and I was just like, I'm tired, man. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And at this point, did you tell your second wife? Um, Not yet, but I, I, mean, I went to my stepdad, and who is a doctor and yeah. who's also sober, and, and he was like, uh, "You should go to meetings." And it took me about a week to actually go to my first meeting, right. and uh, and then I was pretty hardcore AA. Right. In the and then of course I came clean to the girl I was dating, and then came clean to people around me, and you know, um, stayed away, didn't hang out with the agents, you know, didn't right. like really like kind of just started just changed my life, and right. um, in the process of it, it had my ambition was back. Like I was hungry. Like yeah. really, I was like, I'm gonna show everybody yeah. that I'm that I'm me. Like like forget like you know fuck everyone, man. This is like this is it. Yeah. You know, like I'm gonna. Sh- this is my comeback. Yeah. So in my grand plan of my comeback, I decided I'm gonna put together a multiracial TLC. Okay. And I'm going to get writers and song. Or get writers to write to tracks from Jr. I'm going to uh-huh. cut JR in. So I went to JR and Zach. I'm like, you got to give me all the tracks that people aren't buying. Right. So give me the tracks. We go out and, you know, JR helps find writers and whatever. But at this point, he's he's like, his only success has been like, you know, he had like a, a, the Best Friend remix for 50 Cent and like right. a little Kim song that like peaked at like 30 or sure. something, Lighters or something, yeah. whatever it was, or Whoa, or I forget what it was called. But um, so he's like, you know, he's in playing keys for Dre. Like he's yeah. like up and Zach's still building JR at this point. Yeah. He's JR is not JR. Right. Um, and then also, you know, my client slash friend Ryan is also giving me songs and ideas for the girls. For this. So I went out and put this girl group together. And I took all my, I was living at home still. Right. I took the little money I was making, like $400 a week from the agency, spent it on studio time right. for the girls and put together this girl group. And, um, and uh, yeah, and I tried to. Um, Get it signed. Yeah. Wait, so wait, how is it? It's crazy to think that. While I was in, it's, while I was an assistant at the agency, basically, it's weird to think that Neil Bogart and you know his son is spent needing to search for use uh, like the little money that you're making in a week to find studio time. I feel like the city probably would have studio space for you. Were you at this point no. trying to be like I'm cutting, I'm doing you know my own thing? Here's or? here's, a, here's a crazy thing. So my dad, being who my dad was, people yeah. assumed that. I, people gave me things, but because my dad passed away when I was four, his friends in the industry would always want to talk about him, but right. they never wanted to give anything for it. It was all of the uh, uh, assumption of nepotism and none of the benefits. Wow, my entire yeah. life. Yeah, I never got one thing because right. of who my dad was. Right, and. To a certain point, at a certain point in my life, eighteen to twenty six, yeah. basically right. twenty eight ish, ass- assumed and felt entitled to it. Right. There's, a, I mean, there's that huge difference of deserving and earning. You know, and you when you feel like you deserve it, nothing happens. Right. But when you feel like you've earned it, right. things happen. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I don't think anything's really easy as ever. I've ever nothing's ever really come easy in that way for me. Right. I've always I always feel like oh this is the this is going to be the easy thing for me. This is like oh this is the time when I get my luck rolls my way. I've always had to work really hard for everything. Yeah. And I just at this point I just accept I'm going to. I don't ever think about like well maybe it'll just be this easy this time. No, right. it's it's always rolling a ball up a hill. Wow. It's fine. So when you got at this point speaking of rolling a ball up hill, you're Developing a multiracial girl group, <laughs> which is probably like talk about rolling up a uh, yeah you know, yeah, yeah. A no no I was I was insane but like this was like my big like war, like you know I'm, I th- I'm back. when I think I'm about when I think of ideas I try to think of like yeah. bit larger than life not yeah, like let's find one artist who can sing with a great song right. this was like I'm thinking world yeah. arenas and like 
you know, yeah. this is like the biggest thing ever. We're gonna, I got to find their waterfalls. Like sure. you got to do that, you know? So yeah. there's like this Israeli rapper. Right. And this black girl singer and this white girl singer. Right. And all of their songs are being, you know, 90% produced by an unknown J.R. Rodham and like right. 10% produced by an unknown Ryan Tedder. Right. And about 40 songs in, Zach is like, dude, you got, we can't shop this group, man. We need hits. Like, these are all really good songs, but like, but if we don't have a hit, like, we're yeah. dead in the water, man. Right. Like, and Jar and Zach had this crazy idea. They're like, why don't you try writing to some of the tracks? Like, you know, you write for fun. Like, I've been joking around. I'll write on stuff, like, mess around and stuff, you know? They're like, right. you're like, so talented. You're so creative. Like, why don't you write something? And then all of a sudden, so the soft sell. I went, I went, <laughs> yeah, I went, I went home and I was, JR gave me all his reject beats that he wasn't selling. Wow. And um, I listened to all the beats, and the first song I wrote was to this one beat called, it was a song called Jungleistic. Right. Uh, that didn't work out, did it? Especially for a multiracial group, huh? No. You think maybe that was a bad title? No. No, it was like, it was <laughs> like, still it, was like it was like, let, it was like, let, it was like, let's sweat, get wet, get jungleistic, dun, 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 ballistic. You know, there's this like, it was, it was, and by the way, like the fact that I even knew melody yeah. was like a surprise to me. Yeah. Like I surprised myself that when I went to sing, like I wasn't singing, like, you know, sometimes you get they're like, no, you could sing melody and people just sing to the chords and you're like, right. oh, they can't, they don't hear it. Right. Like the fact that I could hear it was just. Was a surprise to me, but I I loved it. And I was as a rapper, everything wow. I wrote was everything I wrote was like a rapper, right? So it was all internal right. rhyme schemes and like super clever yeah. lines that you'd never work in pop music. Um, then I wrote another song was terrible, and then the the third song I wrote, so the second song that we ended up keeping was over a thrown away beat sampling "Tainted Love" by Soft Cell, wow. and I went and played them for Zach and Jar, and they're like, "Dude, you wrote those all yeah. by yourself?" I'm like, "Yeah,", yeah. and they're like. I mean, yeah, like that's incredible. Cut them on the girls. Let's go shop them. Right. Like they were like that excited about them. And even SOS has written like a rap song. I mean, like it even just right yeah. right away. It's just all internal rhymes and right. like it's you know, it's it was originally called uh um uh Rescue You and then like something else in like parentheses, I forget what it was. SOS wasn't even in the title at all. That's not what I called it. It was like rescue rescue you losing. But it. those are those lyrics, you just changed the title. Jay Brown changed the title. Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So we um we shop we uh go to shop the group. JR and Zach go to New York. They do showcases in LA. The girls are terrible in the room. They just right. completely choke in every meeting. Right. No one wants to sign the group. Everybody wants to buy the songs. Interesting. So yeah. even the labels are they're savvy enough JR at this and Z point. Yeah, the labels are, almost every label said the same thing, which is like, yeah, but we have these girl groups that are already signed. Like could we we could use the songs. I'm just not sure about the group. Right. And JR and Zach eventually called me and were like, uh good news, bad news. I'm like, what? And they're like, the bad news is you gotta drop the girl group. <laughs> like, right. what? This is my comeback. What are you yeah. talking about? This is the worst news in the world. It's not even bad news. That's like four hundred dollars. <laughs> worst news. Worst news. But um, uh, good news is we sold the songs. Okay. What do you mean you sold the songs? They're my girl, girl They're group my, songs. Yeah. So upset. You're so, so upset. Pissed. So pissed. Trust and me. You're trust me. Sober, trust you're me. Sitting Evan, there being like, I should go and six, have a like drink. six months sober. Yeah. Trust me, Evan. They this this, this is going to be better. This is going to yeah. be better. Trust me. And they were, they were uh, right. yeah, well, at, f at first, Christina Milian was cutting SOS. Oh, interesting. And then she turned it down. Yeah. And then it was like sat there for a few months, like, okay, I guess nothing's going to happen with the song. And then it was like, Jay wants to cut it on this new chick they have, this girl Rihanna. And then they sent us the song of her singing it. And I was like, perfect. I was like, this is terrible. Really? Yeah, because you, you, you take for granted the fact that you know her accent now. Oh right, that's right. But at the but time, like a, you were like, you were, you were like, what the hell is this accent? Right. This is terrible. She said, she kind of sounds like like there's something wrong with her, like mentally, like it was a little <laughs> off. Like you were like a little confused by the way she was pronouncing words. You were like, what? How would that ever work on pop radio today? Right. You know. And then listening back to the original demo now, yeah, it's so vanilla because she she's had so much personality and yeah. and and her voice is what yeah. made it. Her tone, I mean, that, that thing of tone is worth more than skill. Yeah. And she's, her tone is so oh, unique yeah. that, that, and she was that accent's she actually an advantage. She was, just, she was just growing into it. She yeah. didn't even know what she had yet. Yeah, she had pawned on to replay, and then SOS is yeah. like her first real number one, it was, yeah, real it was her, pop hit. Yeah. And, we, and she, they shot the video for SOS on her 18th birthday. Wow. On her, we were at, we were there at the video. She was on her, it was her birthday that day. 
That's crazy. And at this point, you're thinking, oh, that's cool, but you, it's an, generally like m- at that point, she's a mid level artist. Well, the song so came like, out in January cool. 2006. Uh huh. In May 2006, the same day I got made full agent at APA, the song went number one in 15 countries. Wow. So when you say, going back it to you. It took five months for it to go number one. Yeah. Long story short, by the way, it was the first time ever that they held back a single on iTunes and the song was flying up the charts and they really, it was the first, it was, Why a, it was brilliant. Why were they holding it back? What is it? It was number 30, 33, number 32, number 32, number 32. Yeah, right. Dropped the single on iTunes. One. Wow. It was the first time I ever saw that. I'd never seen any. I, ne- I don't, I, if someone can tell you me. You number one, number one at radio, number one on Billboard too? Yeah, is yeah. That the whole thing? Number one on both. Yeah. It, it was number going number one on radio and they hadn't even released it on iTunes yet. Like That's it wasn't out so yet. Nuts. So when they dropped it, it shot to number one. Right. Because of the sales. Right. Um and uh, was that Jay's idea? Was that like a I, manager? Someone, move? yeah, something like that. I don't know. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was genius at the time, and no one had ever done it. Obviously, it's, it, you know, nowadays people drop songs before they even go to radio and they go to number one. Mm-hmm. But back then, radio led, and um, and yeah. So going back to your original comment, <laughs> six years ago, uh, or it feels like six years ago, mm-hmm. I was an agent. When the bagels want, were and, fresh, and I didn't want to leave when the big, and I didn't want to leave being a songwriter either. I wanted to do both because I got made agent the same day that the song went number one. Right, and you had aspirations at that point. You probably think I could run, you know, be a big agent, and, right? You know, yeah. I can write songs on the side. That's what it was. And then Jr. and Zach called me like every day, dude. You got to leave the agency, dude. Yeah. You got to you got to leave the agency. What are you doing? And I would come. Why? Why wh- is that a mistake? Yeah, I tell people all the time. And why is it a mistake? Because now, now we actually know when we can actually sense when one of our songs is 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 reacting, go. right? Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do when we know a song is going to go? We write like crazy, like crazy, right. because you know that the nature of this industry right. is that when you have a hit song, everybody wants to know every, what else do you have, right? Right. So I didn't know that at that time. Not only right. did I not write like crazy prior right. to the song going out, I wrote part time for the four months post the song being number one. Sure. Which is like insane. That's so crazy. <laughs> like in retrospect, you would never do that. You'd be like, "Oh, song number one. Okay, peace. I'm gonna go do another job." Yeah, like that's, that's like, so crazy. Like, no, you capitalize on that. Even I mean, if you, you hadn't written that. prior to that, you go crazy, right? You just double sessions every day. Like, what do I got? You know. And, and Jr. So, was frustrating like, for Jr. because his writer was had a day job. Well, it didn't and it's not a at that point. It's probably not really a money issue. It's just a focus issue. No, of course, of like, total focus it's issue. Ego, like an and also, he would, JR was doing like 20 hour days too. Like, so I knew I could do night sessions with him. You right. know, he was like on this like insane. Because di- he was seven days a week, 20 hours a day. Because he was capitalizing on it. He knew better. Yeah. And he had a manager that was pushing that. Pushing, yeah. I probably pushing him to work less, but JR just wouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't hear that. Right. You know, he was just. So, you know, in the meantime, they, um, Eventually, Jr. They called me and they were like, "What's it going to take, bro? What's it going to take for you to leave the agency?" And so I said, "I thought of the the craziest thing I could think of at the time, which was like, I don't know, put me in the studio with Britney Spears." Right. And the next week, me and Jr. spent the entire week in Vegas with Britney Spears. She was a huge fan of SOS. And uh, crazy. And you were like, "Okay." And this I came, is real. I came back and I quit the agency. Sure. And I told, and I, I, I kept my word. I quit the agency. I went to go write full time. And here's like, you know, one Republican glacier hiking, and you know, what was it what's the Ryan's band from uh, C- Captain Cuts? Oh, the Outline. The Outline. So these three bands are sort of just now floating around. I, never, I mean, I was you know, friend. Ryan and I never talked about it. Obviously, we became really good friends and and whatnot. And our my second wife and his wife are like still really good friends. Yeah. And um. I never thought, like, I always thought in, like, retrospect, like, what it must have been like for being as talented as you are as Ryan. Yeah. And your agent. Please. Hit, no, oh, had a number, number one, one. <laughs> before yeah. you have a hit song. Yeah. It must be, like, a really weird and surreal, sure. frustrating moment. Yeah. You know. It's frustrating. I mean, this is. But, like. I mentioned like, this. Like, I mentioned this in the last I, time I would have been. hung out, but, like, that. The, Envy is really hard in this industry. I I have a really, I wake up in a really good mood, and then I go and I check charts. Why? 
because that's the I first have, thing you do. No, I'm lying in bed. I have three songs on 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 a Don't chart do right it, now. Man. Don't do it. So I'm like watching these charts, but the reality is that there's already songs that are that I see <clears throat> climbing up in front of, and and there are new songs that get released every week, and and all of a sudden I'm still lying in bed with one eye open, checking my phone in a shitty mood because my song's not climbing fast enough, and all that. this, and it's, you know, I see, I think. The closer you are with your friends being successful, the the more excited you are that your friends are successful, and the more envious you are that you're, you know, when you you how close you are because the proximity gets closer and closer. Are, do you have people that are you're happy for, and then there are people you're not happy for? Yeah, everyone does, right? Yeah, I think to a certain extent, I try to be happy, man. I just of course. I try, try, but so there are the people. There are the people who. Um, there are some people where I don't think they're they're particularly talented and they're fortunate for being in the room at the right time over and over again, which means that they must have that vibe. No, that's dude. That's just magic. 90% or of whatever it 90% is. of you know this, dude. 90% of every session is is you in the room. I know. 10% is talent. Uh, I'm, that's probably it's the, right. It's the energy, man. That's what you bring. It's, you know. Yeah. It's like I always say that it lives and dies you by you. If, you're you're if a you're, primary if you're, writer if, if you're, you're in the room. If you're an asshole in the room, no one wants to write with you, yeah. and you probably bring down the room. Right. You know, there's got to sure. be every successful writer out there has to contribute something to the being in the room. I yeah. think. Um, although I will say there are a few successful writers I've written with who are just it's a pain to write with them. Right. But they're constantly successful. Right. So maybe there's something. So to do say. you look at their success and do you get frustrated? No. 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 Uh, or do you look at it and you're just not even affected by it? I'm not it? even affected by it. I don't care. Do you think it's because of the number ones that you've had that you're able to see it from that perspective? Or do you think it doesn't matter? No, I think if you are ambitious, if you're in the music industry, if you're, if you're ever, you're ambitious, period. Mm-hmm. You, you're, you're competitive and you're ambitious. It's, right. it's completely in our, in our nature to be that way. Right. Right. I do my best to run my race with blinders on. Oh, well, yeah. Because I have seen so many writers go up and down. Like, you know, it's funny. Like, new writers pop up and you're like, yeah, this is like, you know, I remember yeah. you when your name was this five years ago. Sure. Like, being there almost 10 years, I've seen yeah. like three or four crops of writers come and go. Sure. And the fact that I still am able to write on records and some years are better and some years are down and some years are back up. And I understand the roller coaster. I mean, even look at JR who's on an upswing again yeah. now, but like, you know, was down and like right. it, it, you know, Luke's had moments that he's been down. Max has had quiet moments. Yeah. Pharrell's had a, has had, had a quiet decade, I yeah. think, you right. know, and like people, you know, that's just the nature of the industry. You know, you go in and out and that's just, I think if you can accept that and you just keep focused on what you believe in and trying right. to make yourself better and trying to evolve and trying to work with new people and, you know, figuring out what makes them fresh and new and adapting that and, and creating it and borrowing it for yourself and not worrying about what other people are doing and understanding that like that's their path. I mean, you could sit there and go like, people always have these massive ups and downs. Like, you know, all of a sudden you have like six hits in one year, five hits the next year, and then no hits the third year. And you're like, I prefer to have like one or two hits a year. Just ride a, s- a smaller you know? wavelength. But I don't want to have like the six hits in one year because I don't want to have the no hits the next year. <laughs> you know, I'd rather I'd rather keep it even right. for my sanity, for my like waking up and not feeling riddled with anxiety moment. Yeah, but did you I, know? I that? would rather just did be you like, know you know that? what, things will be okay. Did you know that af- after SOS? No, no because, because it was your my stepdad. Your my, step, agent. my stepdad said to me, <laughs> "Goes don't leave the agency," and I was oh, like, wow. "Why?" And he goes, "Because you may never have a hit song again." I was like. Uh, thanks, Dad. Right. You know, it was it was like, like mo- that was the third song I've ever written. <laughs> like, before we get to that, because that's kind of interesting, I yeah. just have to ask about Halo. How you go from writing, you know, Sean Kingston, SOS, are, are real poppy songs, and then you write like maybe the biggest song of your career. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So Ryan. Ryan and I would write sometimes, but he was busy with his band stuff, and right. then and this then- is after Apologize, so. Right? Yeah, or yeah, right yeah, around yeah. Apologize. Yeah, yeah, but uh, to Apologize on Timbaland's album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, yeah. on the Timbaland album. Right, right, but yeah. he's just done, you know, no, no, so he's doing, he's doing, he's doing, and, uh, Apologize. He's now the biggest, he went from. He's, he's hot new right. He's like he's, the hot guy yeah. and whatever like yeah. that. So I'm writing with him sometimes, but he's on the sure. road a lot supporting One Republic, sure. right? And um, uh, I don't know what to do. So I'm writing with Greg and he had introduced me to this demo singer friend of his, this kid DQ. Right. And so DQ and I started writing like every day. And, uh, 
and we became like basically writing partners for the better, sure. for, you know, lack of better or whatever. And, um, we started the writing camp together, right. um, which was just a, a collective of us, of a bunch of writers together at the time. Right. We just called it the writing camp. Yeah. Right. And, um, we, uh, in, in, in the meantime, you know, I would write with, with Ryan when I could. Yeah. Ryan's on tour and he's in Michigan and he's playing basketball on an off day and he like yeah. ruptures his Achilles. I remember that. Like shattered it. Yeah. Playing basketball. Yeah. And so they had to go into surgery there and they had to cancel the rest of the tour yeah. and they flew him back to LA. And his first day back in LA, Genevieve went to work and, you know, Ryan was like, you know, on crutches and had to keep his leg elevated and all this other stuff. And I was emailing him every day because he he was like, oh, I'll sing the hook on Save Some. And that was like that era. Oh, was I, it? Really? Yeah, I just remember going to his apartment and he's got his huge cast on. Yeah, and yeah. Like, on, on uh, where was that? On the block away from Highland. Yeah, on, yeah, it was yeah. right. It's like right Wil- by Wilshire where and Highland. Now. Wilshire yeah, yeah. And Highland, yeah. Uh-huh. So um, he, uh, he, I was I canceled my session and yeah. said I, I was gonna I, br- I went and got La Scala I brought like over like salads I was like I'm gonna come hang with you man keep you company while Genevieve goes to work or whatever so like she's like bye you know rest and all that stuff she leaves the closes the door Ryan's like come on let's go right I'm like dude you're yeah. supposed to be resting he's like no 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 he gets up on his crutches and like hobbles yeah. into his studio yeah. room whatever yeah. and he sits down there and um, he's like let's, let's write something for Beyonce like Jay Brown wants something for Beyonce and I was like cool and you know and we were sitting there and I was like you know what we should write. I was like, let's write like Ray LaMontagne Shelter, but cool. like, but like for Beyonce and Jay Z, yeah. yeah. And like, he puts his hands down on the keyboard, and it was the angelic patch. And I was like, you know, like I'll like keep you safe, like you know, like a halo. And he kind of like looked at me, and we were like, cool, yeah, let's write that. Yeah. And then three hours later, we had the song, right? Minus the bridge, right? He sent he sent the song to Jay. An hour later, Jay wrote back and said, "Please hold this. Don't do anything with it." I love it. And Ryan's saying the demo because he's got. Ryan's I mean, saying the demo. I, I think people I have, underestimate I have how great of a voice he has. Also, like his voice can sell. He's he's got that thing. Also, he's like. Of, also, he's the he's the he's the apologize guy. Right. People writers were calling me like McKee, but all these people were like, "Dude, you got to hook me up with the apologize guy." Like no one knew yeah, Ryan yet. Right. He was like the the crazy dope song from the Timbaland album. You got. I want to write with that. And guy. this is. I think "Apologize" came first, and then "Bleeding yeah, Love" yeah, of course. knocks off his own song yeah, number yeah. one. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which was a Jesse McCartney song. Was a Jesse McCartney song, right? right. Um, but uh, yeah. So uh, the next day, we decide. We're, you know, we're gonna ha- we're gonna have. Uh, you know, we go out to eat that night to go out to dinner with our with my, with Ashley and Genevieve. Sure. And uh, you know, Ryan's like. Dude, it's a smash, right? The song's a smash, and I'm like, it's really good. And he's like, dude, it's a smash. I was like, I can't say that, man. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, there I, is that thing. I just, I like, just can't do that. It's I can't, only a I smash can't. in retrospect. It is, but like, yeah. but like, I knew there was something special about it, but I didn't want to. I just couldn't say it. Right. It was too, you know, whatever. So the next day, we said, let's, let's write a bridge. They love it. There's no bridge. Let's write a bridge. So we came back in and we spent three hours, the entire length that wrote us the rest of the song, yeah. writing a bridge. Right. Um, and in the bridge, we actually, the original bridge, he has like a part that he's like, you will shelter me and I will shelter you. Like it was like a yeah. paid homage to Ray. Right. Like, you know, we were like, it's a very clever bridge, right. which no longer exists. She ripped it out of the song right. and did her opera thing. It's probably. Which was way better than our bridge, right, right? right? You're like, damn, why didn't we think of the opera thing? Right? <laughs> like, it's probably a good, it's probably a good thing that, uh. And, and, and nowadays, it like if people knew that 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 was that that inspired you, that would bring a whole other. Well, I mean, there's nothing in the song that sounds like it. So you sure? I totally get that. Yeah, it, it wasn't saying, like, like we were inspired crazy, by Ray. Like you're being sued. It's not. Right, it wasn't like right. it's not close to shelter. Right. It was just like what it, we, we, we were we were we were drawing from the concept of shelter. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that being said, had we left the bridge in with that line. That would be we may been, so we may have been screwed, right? So, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so she pulled that out. She ad- and you know she added a word to the song, right? Which to this day I still don't understand how we didn't write that word. What was the word? It, and it it rhymed. Like we left an un, an unrhymed sentence open, and she just added a word that rhymed. Um, she's like, "Gravity can't begin." We our demo goes to pull me back to the ground. She uh-huh. added again. Yeah, right. How did we not think of that? Right. Like, it's the most, like, bizarre thing. Like, 
can't begin to pull me back to the ground again. Yeah, of course. Duh. Like, yeah. we left it ground. Why'd you do that? I don't know. If you look back and listen to the demo of Ryan singing, I'm like, why did we not say again? Do you ever listen back to that demo? Yeah. And it's weird. This is that thing where, um, where when you write at home and you have an acoustic guitar, piano, and you're writing with somebody, you haven't really produced out the record. Maybe you put a couple drums down, shit like that. And then the song becomes a worldwide, you know, a real smash. Like the kind of song, to me, Halo's the, you know, I remember when you were telling this story where you were in a meeting and somebody said to you, put on Halo and said, this is just to remind you. Yeah, Marty uh, Bandier. Yeah, this Dude, is to remind best, you of what you can do. That was the best, like best and like, I mean, funny. I thought it was funny. I mean, it was yeah. it was meant as like a, a jab. Maybe it was tongue in cheek though. Marty's a tongue in cheek. I think it's guy. a tongue in cheek thing. Yeah. Because because you are you did you do write that in a in a tiny room. Yeah. And you think this no, is a you, and you guys are out and later Ryan's saying this is a smash and you're saying I don't know if I can say that yet. And then if you were to walk down the street, I think it's one thing when you say all the people you've written with. It's another thing to say I wrote Halo. Even if you say I wrote SOS, there's probably you know the Rihanna song. Sometimes that's a big song, but you know that song. The fact that you can say Halo is yeah. the same thing as saying Umbrella, or you know, it's like it's a massive copyright. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, it, I imagine that still comes. I would up love constantly. to write another one, but I'd be happy. I'd be I I'd, I'd, I'd be okay if there's a you know the author from Eat Pray Love. Yeah, she does this TED talk where she talks about. What happens when you try to write after you've written your biggest success? You know that she knows that she's not going to beat Eat, Pray, Love. It was so big, was made into a movie. And what is the emotional approach to following up what is clearly going to be an impossible thing to match? You have to write something totally different, which you've done. Different and successful in a different way. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's where... I mean, you can't... You can't... You, tonight, tonight for how shall I was about to say you can't you it's can't like, put Halo and Tonight Tonight in the same world, but yet Tonight Tonight technically had more radio success than Halo. Oh yeah, I'm right? not surprised. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't even like nearly come close to the cultural impact. Right. But the song itself is over like a half a million spins at radio to date. Like yeah. it's like it's a massive radio song yeah. that you know went top five at pop and number one at Hot yeah. AC. It was multi format, recurrent. Yeah. You know, sync to High Heaven. I mean, I bet, but I, but I, you but you would yeah. never no one no one ever like walked down the aisle to tonight tonight or like you know right. they don't perform tonight tonight at like a Haiti relief concert you know like <laughs> that's so funny it's, you know it right. doesn't have the cultural impact and that's the thing is you wouldn't had, be nominated had, for Grammys you've you had know? so many songs that have been secretly very successful you know I think it girl yeah is like kind of sh- nuts should have been way more successful or take you there even the Sean Kingston these were pretty pretty big records yeah. that they're all top tens. Yeah, that's Not. pretty amazing. But I, there is something about, to me, I think Halo's just, it's hard to, it's hard to beat it. It's like, Tonight Tonight is actually really impressive. It'll the be- fact that you, you broke a band. I mean, uh, Savin said that to me once where he, he was talking about how with um, One Direction and with Cher oh, yeah, Lloyd, course. how no matter how many hits you have with Usher and with Britney and all that, you're yeah. just another song for them. Yeah. But if you can break an artist, yeah, yeah, that's that's the go- know, that's the golden keys. Because after the, tonight, to, tonight, uh, you then have the ability to sign MKTO. You have the ability to because to, of to do yeah. really Boardwalk ends up getting probably more credibility too. Just yeah, and and the with e- and, and then the E Man partnership solidifies, and and me and E Man and Lindy go on a run and write a bunch of stuff together. And- so with you and E Man, is that? It, I mean, Boardwalk is not E Man. That's no, separate. That's that was prior to. Right, and so the stuff that you do with E Man is that that's is easy is easy's boardwalk boardwalk, and how do you how do you define like, how are you able to balance all of it? I mean, being a writer, having boardwalk, having your relationship with E Man, do you feel like there is that you have enough time in a day? No. Never. What are you talking about? I don't Time. know. Yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> but like, but that's the thing. I mean, at some point, no. you have to prioritize. How no. do you prioritize? Um, it's tough. You do. You just have to. Like, you know. I mean, I feel like um, I try to balance writing. You know, it's, it's really hard. I'll, I'll, for instance, like 
the the first I say the last quarter of last year and the first half of this year was spent working almost completely on like three or four projects. Right. You know, and the second half of this year has been spent almost completely writing for other projects, which has resulted and always has resulted in way better results. You're right. Right. All of a sudden, like songs are being cut. Sure. People are calling me in, calling you into projects. People are like, oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. Evan's not just doing his self contained thing. No, when but, you do but the for a minute, thing. for a minute, but if yeah. those artists blow up, right. The reward I know is so much greater sure, than having a what cut we were on about Jason Derulo, a Zayn Malik, you know, right. or having a cut on right. Rachel Platten, or having a cut on right. even Usher, or someone right. who's like an established heritage artist. Right? right? It's so much bigger to have your own because, like, the Jason Derulo factor, like you said. But you saw what I mean. But you saw what it did for you saw what it did, it did for also. JR. That if and when you're on yeah. that that when that second Jason album doesn't do so well, right. the Second Sean album. All of a sudden, do you're, well, you, you're you put yourself out. out you put yourself out of the game. Yeah. So I think there was a quickly a quick shift to okay. I see where this is going. I've seen it with other people already. I'm not going to be a victim to that. Let's start. Let's start really writing for a lot of projects right now and just, you know, remind people that you exist because like out of sight, out of mind in this business, more than nine months. Do you and Eman write together like, with like, these other people or are you writing with other uh, both, uh, outside? Yeah. Both, you know. I mean, we have, Eman and I have really great chemistry. So we have like a bunch of writers who will come in and write with us sure. or artists that will come in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we both write, we don't write exclusively with each other. Right. You know. Oh. Well, you know, I have to say that it's pretty cool because, you know, if you, you look back at 2007 and the first thing I was going to mention was that, that there's an email from me to you being, checking in on these songs because you gave me a CD of tracks from JR and you were the one who said you should write to these, you'd be good at this. And you said you and Ryan were, you know, when you heard... Uh, some of the glacier hiking stuff, you thought that I'd be good at writing pop stuff, and I should probably yeah. do that. And I remember you how, showing how did that, me. How did that turn out for you? Obviously, pretty well. <laughs> I mean, it's in, it's insane. I mean, that's a really cool thing. I I think of you guys kind of as, you know, we're your Eskimo. Know, we're your Eskimos. You're my Eskimos. As they say in like AA, the person who brought you brought you in from yeah. the cold is that your Eskimo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on some, I love that because that's sort of what it is. And I don't talk to Ryan very often, but, and I don't know if he'd realize that he has that, that kind of influence. But when you're in a band and you're trying to figure out LA and the one band we're playing with is One Republic and my booking agent writes a number one song and both you guys are like, you should get into this. This would be good for you. <laughs> you think, well, this you're is like, kind of interesting. You start like, what seeing, is life? This <laughs> is the weirdest shit and you ever. Start, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to not enjoy my band and I'm starting to think, well, this is, there is this part of the music we're industry. We're only at like a, like, I feel like we were at like a, Next to like a color me mine or something. Were we sitting at like a coffee bean or like a rosty chicken or something? Probably. On Be South Beverly Drive. That's probably right. Yeah. yeah. It's just a strange concept. <laughs> and then and then to think that now we're sitting sort of as peers and that I stuck with it and then I ended up doing well enough that like it's being part of the family and then to have us and then co write together on occasion and to be I mean the the trail of people connected by you and me is just out of control now. I mean, we just are part of the same of course. group. Yeah. And it's just so strange to be, I'm going to be in a band and and you're going to be like, I'm going to try being an agent after being a drug addict. And it, Professionally. You, <laughs> professional drug addict. <laughs> no, no, but to go to go and be, be in this situation where what are the odds that we're sitting here having a conversation Nine years later, and be what a crazy nine years! Just out of control to think same, that that's same, where we were. The same depressing odds that in nine years from now we we might not be sitting here. That's true. <laughs> uh, that's like, an amazing way to end this. <laughs> it's like a horrible. Let's all let's all go cry now. No, I'm just no. I just I, I don't. You know who knows? Like I could be living in Japan nine years from now. Sure. You could oh, be totally. Like, you know, you could oh, yeah. you could be running for Congress. Like yeah. I don't like who knows. Like, uh, right? well, I want to. I mean, you know, and, I mean, nine years is like a literally a lifetime. If you look back, yeah. the fact that nine years ago, yeah. SOS came out, it yeah. feels like yeah. forever, yeah. and also somehow feels like it's yesterday. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us on iTunes. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to Jeff Sparger, David Silverstein from Mega House Music, and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan. <laughs>